Yeah, so Matt, it's um, you know, great to speak to you. So here's the thing: you're from originally from Boston, is that right? So it's close to right. I spent a lot of time in Boston. I'm originally from DC, and that's where I live now. Um, and then I went up to Boston for college, and uh, like immersed in the music scene up there and I ended up staying after college and working at it used to be called Fort Apache um and when Paul Coldry reopened it he called it Camp Street Studios and I was his assistant at that time so it was a really Boston's Boston's near and dear but it's not my hometown so are you in Boston now or are you in Los Angeles I'm actually in DC you're in DC so but you did spend some time in LA, right? I sure do. Yeah, I split my time. I um I got to LA once a month and I do like I'll do like a week's worth of writing sessions and then I'll come back to DC and I have a studio here too, so oftentimes I have a client uh here and I'll be doing the production for my LA work sort of in the background. Okay. Well, um I don't know. I would rather be in LA for these two months out of the winter season for sure yeah i just got back from la and it was super nice there yeah usually when i'm there i usually head to the santa monica mountains nice uh, and um uh, but no i i like la i'm not i'm not crazy about what's happening to these kind of cities now but um i definitely like the weather so now you also went to boston university is that right Yep. And I got a degree in psychology. Uh-oh. <laughs> don't worry. I don't use it that often. Well, I mean. It comes in handy in the music business. Got to tell you. It, it does. But, you know, the term is that psychology, you can figure other people out. But also, too, in the meantime, you can make yourself go crazy. <laughs> I try not to, but it is difficult. <laughs> now here's the thing boston university psychology and you ended up in the music business so that's an interesting transition in parallel believe it or not i was in college and i actually studied business and marketing and spent some time in the big pharmaceutical world oh, wow. before entering into the music business. And I actually called on doctors and surgeons all across New Jersey. Wow. So that's awesome. It is. I, I can't, I haven't really met any other person in the business that kind of had my background. Not that it's anything special. It's just, it was a complete jump. And so what, what made you, what was the thing for you? Just love of music or? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I always played the drums. I played in cover bands. I played in original bands. I actually, I was the guy that kind of managed the bands. Nice. I think that if I wasn't there holding it together, the bands would most likely probably not last over six months. Also, I was kind of the guy to you know, hire the members, fire the members, get the gigs. And so, yeah, I, I grew up, I think very similar to your background. I grew up in the eighties. I grew up with the big hair bands, like everybody. I, my dream was to become Tommy Lee, Tommy Aldridge or, or any of those drummers. So, but you know, I mean, I'm not sure if I had it in me to actually to start that band and become the next Bon Jovi, Skid Row. In fact, in my area, Bon Jovi and Skid Row, I mean, those were kind of like neighbors of mine. So mm. we, would we would practice at a place called Butterfield Studio in Red Bank, and they'd be practicing, you know, next to us. So, mm. but, but I said, I don't, I, I don't, right, but I, but I don't think I ever had the players to make mm. that kind of a commitment. So I went to college for business with a minor in marketing. And I went out and I got a job as a pharmaceutical rep. At the time, it was a very coveted job. Mm. But that was not my actually my dream. I did not be like, I want to do this the rest of my life. I gotcha. wanted to be in the music business. 
And I kind of just, that's how I, you know, I'm not going to give you my long story because I really kind of, I think probably your story is a lot cooler than my story. So um, I want to, I want to hear what you have to say. And the fact that here's what's crazy. I was going through your discography and what's really interesting is you've worked with, and this is crazy. Young Bloodhawk, Under Oath, The Used, The Static Age, The Receiving End of Sirens, The Main, The Junior Varsity, The Cab, The Amity Affliction, The Almost, Taking Back Sunday, Simple Plan, Plan White Tees, Ariana Grande, Demi Lovato, Hollywood Undead. This is like such a wide variety of artists. And what I love about this is most people can't find themselves out of one single genre. Mm. So explain. So great question. And I really appreciate that perspective because that's my thing, right? My bottom line, the core of my being is all about facilitating better communication, whether it's talking communication, music communication, songwriting, whatever. The thread for me, the common thread, especially with all those wide variety of musicians is every single one of those musicians is somebody who has a story to tell and they need in often, you know, circumstances, somebody like me to help them tell that story and to to help them bring it out. What I like about looking back at my career and all the different genres that I've been a part of is that that common core is genreless. You could be just as good or bad at telling your story if you're in a metal band as if you're Ari Grande. You know, it's like the, there's there's issues with musicians being able to really get their stuff out there. And, and that's what I aim to do is just bring out the best in all these people. And like, I'm just a big fan of eclecticism. You know, Prince is one of my favorite artists of all times. He's genreless. You have no clue where he's coming from and he can bring a... Led Zeppelin guitar solo into like a Curtis Mayfield soul ballad. I mean, you just, you never know what you're going to get. And that always made him so exciting. Um, So that, that's how I modeled my career loosely was, can I find the commonality between all musicians, all artists? Is a song just a song at the end of the day? Is emotion just emotion at the end of the day? And it's like, being on the other end of working in all these different genres and working with all these different kinds of musicians is the answer is yes. There's a lot of commonalities between all of these people. And that that's what moves me and motivates me is, is that fascinating uh, standpoint of the artist of seeing the world in a unique way in a different way than anybody else does. And then if we get it right, they tell their story, they sing their songs, and there is a connection point for their fans and people do understand and, and can really relate to what they're going through. And maybe, just maybe, those fans and those, those audience members were going through something similar and were not capable of expressing that emotion and Taking Back Sunday helped them do it. You know, that that's sort of the way I'm looking at it and the way I've looked at my career. And I'm super grateful. When I hear you read that list, I'm just like, man, I've just been so fortunate to meet up with all these great people and great musicians and great artists and help them tell their stories. So you just mentioned Taking Back Sunday. So they were a band that came out, what what year was that? What year was it when they started generating? Gosh, TBS must have been around 03, 04. I I want to say because they were a generation before Panic and we did the Panic record in 05. So I think I was aware of TBS by 03. So what's interesting is that a lot of these artists that were part of a scene did not sustain themselves when the scene 
was over. Only a few artists will emerge in a scene and only a select few will have sustainable careers. I just don't think that is music. I think that's life in mm. general. But why do you think Taking Back Sunday, which was highly regarded, a critic darling, did not sustain themselves? You know, it's interesting uh, with that band because I, I was brought in to do singles for their record New Again. Um, and it was a great opportunity. I had the greatest time working with them. I would guess I would say that I don't know the inner workings that much because I didn't do like multiple albums with them. I only knew them for that sliver of time. In my outside opinion, in terms of sustaining themselves and longevity, um, I would only assume that it was something with the lineup shifting because they had an original lineup that everybody loved. Then they were a totally different band for a long time. Then certain members came back and certain members were out. And now I believe their original lineup again. And so I can only imagine that between potential interpersonal stuff and then potential just like logistical, everybody has families and, and that kind of stuff that something got lost along the way. There was a period of time um, where some of our bigger acts in the emo scene were not necessarily delivering records for the fan base that wanted to receive them. And um, that definitely was a difficult period for emo in general, which was maybe around 2010-ish, you know, uh, and so maybe they maybe they were caught up in that, but I, I don't want to say that they were, but it's right. potential that they delivered something that their fans weren't into or something like that. I, I, I don't know with that particular band what the actual actual story is in terms of sustaining themselves and longevity. I can tell you that on the other part of the spectrum in terms of that band being iconic and the, the fans of that kind of music just absolutely falling in love with them that that was tried and true for a really long time and 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 so you know long long answer to your short question but they sustained themselves much longer than i originally had thought and and had made several records that their fans really loved you talked about taking back sunday possibly having a a lineup shift and even back then i think it's kind of impressive how long band stayed together because today try to find four guys that can stay together for more than a year yeah most people have given up and it's just an evolution i mean look at the landscape the landscape right now is all solo artists who got big on tiktok that's 90 percent of what we're looking at the other 10 percent are solo songwriters who were songwriters before they were stars like Ryan Tedder and Sia and stuff like that, Bruno and whatever. I'm going to open this up here because you mentioned TikTok. And the thing is that every time I say something that challenges music or challenges technology, I'll get a comment saying, you're showing your age. <laughs> but, but but here's the thing, Matt. I think that's very unfair comment. Mm. One, I'm not old. I'm not walking with a cane. I can probably do 50 to 100 push-ups and some pull-ups. So I'm not, <laughs> I'm not old. Two, kind of have a background in marketing. In marketing, you're, you, you're, you're never in a, a bubble. In marketing, you see the world from the outside and you cater to the culture. So I'm not writing with a fountain pen and I'm not here, you know, have a typewriter next to me. So, but every time I make a comment, it's, you're old. no, I'm challenging the status quo. Yep. See, people are accused of being out of touch anytime when they challenge the status quo. Mm. 
people who are on TikTok right now, the young kids, when I mean young, I mean like young, like, do they want that to change? Do people who are making a living on TikTok, do they it, want that? So it's, it's a loaded question, right? A, a lot to unpack in what you just asked. Okay. My opinion is this, right? Those kids, I've spent a lot of time with the, 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 that community of artists. They've already changed it. It's already a whole new, it's an entirely new music business. They, it's already done. And there are people on varying degrees of the spectrum who are willing to acknowledge and embrace it, right? There's people who are just like, I'm waiting for touring to come back. That's how bands sell records. That's how bands sell merch. And I respect that opinion. All good, right? There's people in the middle that go, hey, I want to take that thing that's happening on TikTok and put it through the old model so that it has longevity and it has legs and whatever, right? Mm -hmm. that, that kind of working right now. That's your Doja Cats of the world. And I, I think that's kind of working. But the kids who are actually really mastering the algorithm, like, you know, like Joey Balance or like Damien Styles, Waco the Child, like there's like this community of people that I have worked with, they're not looking at any of that stuff. They are solely focused on where they're impacting and their world is robust enough to sustain them for now. They making tons of money. They've got tons of platform. They can sell way more merch than anybody can sell on a, on a tour and they can do it in one day to a worldwide audience. My children, I have three girls they don't tell me what's big on radio anymore. Their favorite band is the week is uh, is the neighborhood at the moment. And I'm like, how do you even know about sweater weather? And they're like, oh, it's huge on TikTok. And I'm like, well, what else do you like? MKTO classic. And I'm like, it songs like 10 years old. And they're like, not to us, huge on TikTok. So the charts that we look at, that we grew up looking at, they don't exist anymore. It's all over there. And I'm not saying it's TikTok either. It'll be a new platform in a month. You know, Absolutely. It's, it's not the vehicle. It's just that that kind of vehicle is now the accepted medium for that younger generation. So we're not old at all. It's just that we have a choice as to how much attention we want to pay to the old paradigm versus the new paradigm or somewhere in between. I get the luxury in my vantage point of being able to plug in at any point any place in that spectrum, as long as I'm open to it, you know what I mean? I can work in the new model. I can work in the old model. I can make the new model work in the old model, the old model work in the new model, you know, and I think as a 2022 music business professional going forward, that's the kind of aptitude that we should be, that we should be embracing. It's just that openness and anything can happen. Anybody can get big. Absolutely. And when I actually got into the music business, it was like the year 2000. And I actually walked into it when there was disruption. Hmm. You know, I, I put up one of the first blogs in the music business. And um, this was prior to social media. And you're right, technology changes constantly, it's changing right now. But here's another thing. I don't know if you're aware. There was an article floating around by the Atlantic that the majority of music that's being purchased today is catalog music. Mm. And the top 200 tracks, new tracks, and they're not necessarily even new, make up a minutia of the streaming mm. business. Unbelievable, right? But I can tell you this, the labels can't sell new music. You, you, that's really what it comes down to. What do you identify that? I have a theory on that. Okay, well, I'll give you mine. Yeah, I want to hear yours now. I'll share mine too. Well, honestly, I do have a theory, but I probably won't end up saying it on here because it's something that no one has ever mentioned. Mm -hmm. I see in the article 
streaming payouts, catalog TikTok. <laughs> there those is are all, those are symptoms. Symptoms. Like I said, I'm probably going to hold my breath. Because I know exactly what it is. And if I were to say it, I get a lot of pushback. <laughs> but I, 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 I predicted this, let's say five, six years ago. Mm. I, I knew we were going down this path. Yeah. And everyone was going to wake up one day and be like, what happened? Yeah, I, but, I agree with you. But, okay, so I'm probably not going to probably give you the single most reason of why we got here. And, and, and let, there's not just one single reason. There's a host. So let me hear yours. So it's, it's, it's very tied in with what you just said. It's very tied in with that timing, too. I believe that after the 08 financial crash of the music industry, we focused fully on this, like, desperate singles thing which is like oh my god my q4 numbers are off like i need a single i need a single ah! right and we all lived it we all lived through it it was the death of the album like blah 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 right we know what that felt like what we lost in, along the way and i've had this conversation with a number of people is we stopped and we might have even stopped earlier it might have been part of the crash but we stopped looking for developing and cultivating legends legends are what sells in the music industry. Legends are what sell all over the sports industry. It's legends that we're missing. And we used to actively seek and cultivate and develop Bob Marley, Billy Joel, whoever, you know, like these iconic Bruce Springsteen. That wasn't, he didn't just wake up and be Bruce Springsteen. There was a mentality of like, I want to be the best. What does it take to be the best? Here, here's my team. Here's my label. Here are all my supporters and my fans. Together, we're going to go for legend status, right? This is completely lost in the music business. There's no such thing. Nobody talks about this anymore. Nobody talks about iconic, lasting, legendary stars that will always sell. What always sells? catalog you just said it why because there's legends in the catalog the beatles are in the catalog right what made the beatles legends it wasn't chance there was a lot of work that went into that and we've lost our ability to to just see it we just don't even have that perspective at the moment and it's a real, real disservice to the whole music community so that's my version is there's just no attention being paid to like the lifelong career you know that that really drove earlier music absolutely but you mentioned that we lost our perspective so the infrastructure and the foundation is no longer there to build a legend and to recognize a legend right it is definitely blurry you know is definitely difficult. My feeling is that we were searching and searching and searching and searching for kind of a rhythm and a pattern and like a platform. And TikTok, Spotify, it doesn't matter what the name of the thing is. I do feel like this younger generation now is starting to, to get this sense of I myself can go direct message my favorite artist and contribute to his or her legendary status by being a part of it. And you're getting these dedicated fandom fan bases, just like we had with the Kiss Army and stuff like that. Those kinds of building blocks are going to be the new infrastructure to answer what was tossed in 08 and what, what has been missing for the last few years. So I think, I think we will get back there. Everything I see in the music business, by the way, is always a parallel to something back in the day. I mean, we're at the very beginning of a new paradigm. We're like in Detroit Motor City. You know what I mean? Like this is the beginning of something that will end up being very, very 
um, like powerful and it will eventually look like the world we built last time. It was just going to be on a new platform, new paradigm. I agree. We were in the beginning of something and then we're in the middle. I'm not sure, but here is a, another kind of observation. You mentioned about building an iconic superstar and how we lost that art. We also just talked about why people generally have a hard time getting into new music and why catalogs mainly are the focus right now. But here, what do you think of this though, Matt? I interviewed another producer, just worked on with a lot of artists, and he said, without TikTok, there would be no music. And TikTok is music. And my immediate response would be like, wow, that is really insane, but not very good either. Imagine if you're a pharmaceutical company and you said, without TikTok, there would be no drugs. 100%. I mean, the it's fact that 100%. TikTok is the only platform the business has. Well, this that's is not that's not a good thing. Not at all. But you've identified the biggest disconnect we have, right? Which is like, what is disconnected here, right? the the comp The competition, right, is supposed to be between supposed to be between these big three entities, right? Which we've already admitted are having trouble navigating the new world. They've got their cut, you know that. They knew years ago they had to, you know, line up with the merch companies and do all this stuff. They've got their money, right? Or at least what they're used to getting. But they they don't have their finger on the pulse. And I say that with all due respect because I have so many friends who who work at those labels and and I think they're all doing good work, right? But they they're not necessarily their their structures aren't ready to move as quickly as fans right now and so they're kind of getting left in the dust with the old models the thing about tiktok is that the statement made by the other producer is not true right it's actually the exact opposite of true right what we're seeing is that fans and musicians are down to have a direct relationship a direct financial relationship a deck a direct creative relationship right and that they don't care where they have to go whether it's tiktok or myspace or twitter they they don't care they've proven that now six platforms in they just want to be able to connect directly with the artists so if the music business wants to understand what's going on it's not hey there's only one place for your music anymore that's the exact opposite message, right? Now it's like, hey, there's fans that you can access right now who might be into your stuff. And here's a, an array of different ways that you could connect with them. And good luck, put your music on all these platforms and see what connects. I see that as like, when I was a kid in punk rock bands, like, we didn't have that. We had no way of getting people to listen to our stuff unless we got signed to some label or some vehicle, some gateway. So, you know, I, I understand the comment from the other producer. I just, I, I think it's literally 180 degrees the opposite. Well, we are at one point we got out of the wild, wild west in the music business and we ventured quickly back into the wild, wild west because I think We're that once, yeah, one streaming, one streaming came along, they're like, we figured it out. But this year it's like, maybe we didn't figure it out. 
Yeah. And you know what? I'll tell you quite frankly, what it comes down to in terms of old model versus new model. And it's a very, very weird outlook. Right. But like, essentially the old model is locked into, can we sign an artist for an unfair deal? And I say this with all due respect, this is just how it was built. Right. Can I lock a very creative soul into an unfair situation so that I can grab the lion's share of their money, right? And never tell anybody exactly what monies are being, whatever, spent. It's very opaque. It's designed opaque. We sure. all know that, right? It's designed for leakage. It's designed for, you know, whatever, for profit. I totally get that. And a lot of businesses are designed that way. The problem is, is that it's designed for a $20 billion a year industry, right? The issue there is that you now have kids direct to their fans making tons more money, right? And there's tons more money in these democratized platforms where you have complete transparency in numbers, right? The numbers, my algorithm said this, this many followers said this, I've got numbers to prove that, I've got revenue, everything is drillable, which means an outside investor can come in and invest because they can see the financial data. That new music industry, that's $100 billion a year, easily, right? So the problem, really, the myopic outlook has to do with how badly do you need to cling to your fake accounting? Because that is keeping you in a $20.5 you know, billion a year industry versus kids today are like, Hey, I just made the $20.5 billion. What's next? You know, like, what do I do now? You know, and, and the world is theirs. And so I think a lot of the traditional music business accounting honestly holds <laughs> back their ability to be creative. Panic at the Disco. You worked with them on their breakthrough album. Were you shocked that they had all that success? So um, it was shocking, thrilling. I mean, I can't even begin it. Like, it, it, I'm like a guy where like, I'm, I'm in command of a lot of what I do. There's not always so many surprises in my existence and in my life. That one was like a complete surprise. And, and me and, and the guys in the band all felt that. They had never played a show before when they came to the studio. We were, I had done three records, I think, or it was like my third project, my third full length record and had no experience really. And so we were all just kind of winging it. And our goal, they had just gotten signed to Fall Out Boy. Fall Out Boy was doing well and we really appreciated that. But we, um, we thought we were gonna sell like maybe, I don't know, like, 20,000 albums in the whole cycle or something like that. I mean, and we were like, that would be amazing if we sold 20,000 albums in the whole cycle. And like, we sold 10,000 first week. My, my recording costs were recouped week one. And, and then it was just like, oh my God, what's going on? And this was the end of the CD era. So those CDs were, you know, selling for $17.99 and stuff like that. I mean, it's just crazy. It's totally amazing. So we were all surprised. I remember sitting with the band a year later and they were on their arena tour and we went out to a restaurant and then I took them to my car after just so we could just like get away from everybody. And it was just me and the band for the first time since making the record. And I mean, we were just cracking up laughing. Like, did you guys ever think? And this is, they are like major rock stars at this point. Like they have like, perfect makeup and they're all like 62 pounds and have like mismatched Versace shoes and like I mean they're like there and I'm just like oh my god like did you guys ever think that this was gonna go and we just we didn't see it coming it was a it was a blessing it's really cool you also worked with a used and what's interesting is that you had the used and you had My Chemical Romance. My Chemical Romance became bigger than the used, but the used 
was out on the scene first. And then you had Fall Out Boy and you had Panic at the Disco. Again, Fall Out Boy was on the scene first. And then you had Panic at the Disco. Well, Panic and My Chemical Romance became bigger than the bands that broke on the scene first. And again, the used and Fall Out Boy. But you know, you know, My Chemical and The Panic were just bigger artists. They had bigger radio songs. You know it must kill those bands. And there has to be, I don't care what anyone says, there just has to be a little bit of rivalry of like, God, why did this happen? <laughs> it, it, it has to be tough. And then there has to be a self-examination there too, right? Like, is it my team? Is it somebody in the band? Is it, you know, what is it to be a pioneer and then to watch somebody else grab your sound and make it more commercial, make it bigger? And it can't be easy. You know, I get to be lucky, right? I get to be in all those bands and out of all those bands. You know what I mean? And I never even have to live the speaker cabinet. So I'm the lucky one, right? We're lucky. But it is tough. Being in a band is it it's not easy. Having a sound that everybody loves and being locked into, not easy. Not I was easy. a fallout boy drummer. I'll be calling the panic singer. Hey man, can I join your band? <laughs> right it's tough you know um but the um the i think the silver lining and what i try and convey to people is like first of all there's room for all of us and 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 it is a delusion to think oh they got my slot in the lane oh i can't go in that lane like you hear that kind of talk all the time and it's like no way i've seen it's it, what is Bruno Mars doing? Like he's in Curtis Mayfield's lane, right? Biggest right. artist of our time. Like this is amazing. It sounds like Curtis Mayfield. Like there's no rules, right? At all. And anybody who tells me that there are is crazy, right? And for those bands who have that envy of like, hey, I, I like the use, like I took my cam, we took my cam on their first tour. Now they're bigger than us, right? I can, I can hear that conversation backstage and I've been part of those conversations with bands right I was working with Big Time Rush at the same time I was working with One Direction and Big Time Rush and they were on the same label and the BTR guys were like what is going on here you know why are they huge and why are we not and I jokingly remember showing all the BTR guys pictures of the One Direction guys and I said you should take a look at your competition but, you know, that said, it's, ter it's, it's terribly difficult to be in that position, but there's always another song you can write. There's always another up to bat. I've seen people come back from wherever and come contemporary and come kill it. I mean, think about Train. Think about Sweet, what is Sweet Soul Sisters, Soul Sister, whatever that song was. Like, where was he for 10 years before that? Then he comes out with a number one whatever there's no rules in what we do and there's no reason that a band who's having envy can't come back and eclipse the new band and and come back with that fighting spirit so you can't be your own worst enemy and make it in the music industry you just can't you have to be open to the possibility that you could kill it at any minute speaking about opening to the competition i mean harry styles smoked i mean he smoked every single rock band in existed i mean gene simmons will tweet rock is dead you get some backlash well yeah rock is dead because let's be honest we grew up on rock rock sucks it's mm. terrible i'm sorry mm. guy hope you could quote me on this it sucks okay don't ask people to buy your shitty music okay
Okay. Yeah. Harry Styles, One Direction. My wife loved One Direction. Mm. And I'm like, it's cool. It's great. You know, I mean, again, I like all styles of music, but I mean, I would never think Harry Styles would be coming out as a rock guy smoking like the former grunge bands. <laughs> and, um, but exactly what you said, I brought this up because you said, you're always up the bat. You can always write that new song that changes the course of your life. I mean, just like Panic at the Disco, they wrote one record and it changed the course of their life. Fall Out Boy did too. So working with Ariana Grande, how was it working with her different than working with like the used, the panic, other than she has like the most amazing voice in the world. Yep. <laughs> so first of all, I agree with you on Harry, by the way. Like he his solo stuff blew me away and had so much classic rock, you know, stuff. And I just, I mean, those guys are so nice too. That's what people don't understand. Like the 1D guys, like they were so cool and humble and like it was real. And I they're just so nice. Like they're just awesome. Harry really surprised me because I didn't expect him to pull the like hippier kind of sound. And I was so appreciative of, of it because it works great for him. He's a modern day Mick Jagger in that way. And that's how I always saw him. And he really embraced it in a, in a way that, that didn't feel so obvious. It's like, he's pulling from like other seventies stuff, but never from the stones but he's got the look and, it, and the swagger. So it's really cool. They've been brilliant with him. So I totally agree. Demi Lovato, what was it like working with her? She's great. Demi's funny. She's really into a lot of like witchcraft and like Wicca and stuff like that. And she talks about that throughout your sessions. You press record and you're listening to a Ferrari of a voice. It is unbelievable. Like hearing her sing my melodies was unbelievable. And she's just as sweet as she can be. And she'll she'll come into the writing process too. And she'll put in little nuggets for her fans. Like she'll change lyrics and it'll be like a message to her fans. Like they'll know I'm talking about Taylor here. Or they'll know I'm talking about Joe Jonas here. And that kind of stuff. It's it's fascinating. She's grown up since age four in this. And you can feel that through and through. Demi is always on 10 vocally the way she talks and and i'll be honest i mean i was quite surprised i was listening to her a discussion with her on um actually joe rogan and she was actually quite entertaining and what she was discussing about so i was actually shocked that she was very articulate funny and well thought out because a lot of times you don't know what to expect when, at least from an artist. I mean, you see, you hear them sing their songs, but then actually when you hear them talk, you, you know, Jewel was another example where I'm blown away of like how smart this, this folk singer was. Yeah. I mean, just, just well thought out, very smart in, in all topics, well-versed, well-read. And now, when you work with an artist like Ariana or Demi, or when it comes down to working with a band, is your approach always the same? Um, I don't think it ever is, honestly. I, I, I tend to like research before and, and try and plan. Now, I get the benefit of being able to do that musically, right? So there's a number of different tools. I can come into a session and judging by what I think the artist is going to be into, I can say, I should come in with two tracks ready to go, right? That I think they're going to like ready to tweak them, but like, hey, this is a great icebreaker because it's all about that first moment um, and that chemistry and that stuff, if you don't get it right, don't even bother showing up. So it's 
it's strategic for me with every different artist that I work with, what I should have prepared for that session, because I believe the very first like five to 10 minutes determines not only the whole session, but it could determine your whole relationship with that artist. So it's wildly different. If a band's coming in that writes their own music that would never accept co-writing and I'm really there as a producer, I wouldn't dream of presenting them a track. I'd come in and say, play me your demos. Then there are situations where I go, this person's track record speaks for itself. So does mine. We're going to get in a room and we're going to improvise from the get go. And it's none of that stuff has anything to do with music. All that's all that's doing is me establishing that that first pillar of how are how is this person going to view me and how am I going to view them? And is that going to be a healthy and fruitful relationship? Now, when you worked with a band, him. Great album, by the way. But that album was not well received in, I'm not sure if it was in the, the more heavier rock community or if it was their fan base or both. And also times were changing. Do I have that right? I believe so. Yeah, I believe so. And I have unique insight into that. And I had that conversation yesterday. It's so funny. Um, the, the funny thing about Screenworks, right, is that it was not well received. But now I get people like the singer Emotionless in White, for instance, wanted to work with me just because I did that record, because in retrospect, it's his favorite hymn album. And I'm starting to get that more and more. And it's the weirdest thing. So I've had some time to think about it. Because Vile, like, inspired me so much. I learned so much from working with that band. And what did you fun. learn from that? So I, how do you pronounce the singer's name? Vile. Vile, Vile Vallo. So, so what I learned, did you learn? The biggest lesson was that I, that I had some myopic cultural stuff that I had to examine in myself. My biggest lesson was I used to think if it's big in America, it's big, Right. Anywhere else in the world, great. But if it's big in America, that means it's really big. Him was not big in America. They were humongous in the rest of the world. And I learned that I had some real cultural weirdness there, which is like, this is just one territory. This dude's like a mega star. You know what I mean? So that was first. And then um, his musical knowledge, like, it's so crazy. Like, he could, like, do a bass slide up, and he'll be like, that sounds like Sabbath. And then he could do a bass slide down and he'd be like, that's more like Led Zeppelin. And I want it to be more like Sabbath to go up. And I'd be like, it's a bass slide. But then I would listen to what he was saying. And sure enough, he'd be right. He'd be like, yeah, no, the bass, John Paul Jones never slid up. He always slid down. And you can hear it on the records. And he studied those records and he knew. And he just had this encyclopedic way of referencing everything like that. And he was always right on the money. So I, I learned a tremendous amount from him. And I think the record was not well received at the time because he was not in such a great place in his career. You know, culturally, they were not well received. They had just come off of a record that had flopped and not done well, Venus Doom. And that was after a record that had done really well with Wings of a Butterfly. So I just think the whole the label was tired they were tired everything was just didn't line up right for the record and maybe we didn't have the smash i don't know but it's funny because now i have people seeking me out specifically because i did that record and like chris for motionless telling me like that's my favorite him album he's not pulling punches he means it you know what i mean and, and that's the kind of thing where I go, okay, well, you know, I understand it didn't do well, but there's a certain audience where it really resonated and that's, that's powerful. Now, when you work with someone like him and a band, who usually carries the bulk of the responsibility in that band and who is usually the decision makers in mm. the band front. In great your question. Yeah. yeah, it's a great question, especially with him because they're the most unique band I've ever worked with because it's a complete dictatorship. I've never seen anything like it. It was a total cultural thing. It's a Finnish thing. Like 
Vile runs the band. Vile scripts every single note on every single instrument. And the musicians all look to him and go, is this right? And then he says, yes or no, or whatever, or yes, you can take a break, or no, you can't, or yes, you can smoke that cigarette, or no, you can't. Like, it's a complete and utter dictatorship. Polite, totally debonair, super nice, everybody's cool, but there's a boss in that band. And I had never seen anything like that before, ever. There's unspoken bosses in bands, but I've never seen anything where it was like, this is a known fact that dude's the leader and that we don't do anything that he doesn't approve. Matt, you've worked with rock bands, you've worked with all different types of artists, but what really struck me is that you worked with Ariana Grande, superstar pop artist, known for her vocal. What was it like working for her or working with her? So, you know, it's a, it's, it's actually a really cool story. Uh, you know, I tend to do a lot in the formative stages, a lot of development. Um, so I had just finished working with One Direction um, and really the task with 1D was to craft a sound. Um, when I came back from overseas, I got a call from Wendy Goldstein, who was working with Ari already. And the challenge with Ari, of course, was that she was already famous. She was just famous for doing something else. And she was known as this sort of young pitched, uh, you know, light hearted star for Nickelodeon. She had 3 million followers on Twitter, which at that time was like a really big audience. So the challenge that Wendy was faced with and that Universal was faced with was how do we do what we do best? You know, how do we sell her music and sell her as a credible, real, here to stay, legendary pop star um, when she's already famous for being a child star? Uh, so, you know, the challenge, of course, I get these phone calls because I like the artist development part and I like the part that is not usually so fun, um, which is like, these kinds of calls. How do we craft an identity? How do we change an identity? What do we need? You know, what are the, the building blocks for that? So I met Ari, we hit it off right away. We wrote a song called Pink Champagne and, you know, just fantastically talented in every way and a great writer as well. And so great connection. I realized immediately, like, like Wendy had said, she had been linking with producers in LA and that that something was happening between the writing, the tracking, and the completion of demos that wasn't connecting. Uh, in other words, Ari w wasn't finishing our tracks and we couldn't figure out why or Wendy couldn't figure out why. So one of my challenges was put Ariana in the booth and see, do I have the same issue you know like we wrote this great song now she's tracking this great song like what are the issues and you know she did at that time there were issues with completing the songs finishing your work very simple you know like like a lot of us in creative uh industries are great at starting ideas great at getting ideas to a certain point, but then to actually complete and finish is a real commitment. And there was something disconnected there. And so Ari and I talked about that a lot and, you know, seeing ideas through, don't toss something because something doesn't feel like it's a hundred percent you or a hundred percent right or whatever it is. Like, let's, let's make sure we finish what we started. And that ended up being our rhythm and the thing that I did differently that made me the executive producer on the first album was that I was patient with Ariana and I was willing to stick with her as she worked out different uh, issues with songs in the booth or we come back, you know, with a fresh perspective to a song instead of starting a new song on a second day. Let's finish what we started the day before. And through that, process and we did it really through trial and error 60 70 songs that we worked on over a course of about 18 months you know she ended up really achieving two things one getting over that confidence hump you know and, and really um 
learning how to to finish your work and get the ideas into a place where they were workable and listenable and finishable. Um, and then the other thing was the task that we were originally faced with was how do we change her from Ariana from Victorious to Ariana Grande, the star that you know today. And over the course of those 18 months, what was really unique and cool about Ariana is that she was able to let fans into the process of that evolution so that they would hear snippets of the things that we were working on and grow with her. And little by little, and I really credit Ariana with this, she was able to educate her fan base that she was making a change, strategic change with her music. She wouldn't be wearing the red bow anymore, that they would be in for a totally different kind of Ariana at the end of this metamorphosis. And that's exactly what we did. And, you know, the, the moment where I knew that it was working uh, was when she played my song uh, that I wrote with her called Tattooed Heart at the AMAs. Um, I want to say, was that maybe 2012, 2013? Um, she played the AMAs and like brought the house down. It was awesome and i remember um being in a, in a in a publishing meeting the next day with um uh, the head of universal publishing at the time and she was like okay i finally get it because i had been talking about ariana the whole time and this executive was like oh wow i saw it last night i totally understand what you've been talking about and from there she really was off to the races and and it's been absolutely amazing to have played that role uh in that project and to sort of foster the development of that change and watch it turn into what it's turned into she's just an amazing amazing pop star and really has done wonders with her platform there are a lot of girls with really good voices. I mean, I don't think there's any shortage of that. What do you think Ariana brought to the table? Something specifically that launched her where other people may be missing? Such a great question. And, um, you know, really the model that she created has been now sort of adopted by newer artists and is is really the new model, which is, uh, I would say, the, the connection with her fans, her unique ability to get attention, command attention, have something to say, get feedback, get her fan base to, to work certain things or to support certain things. I really think was it was something that I had not seen before. And it was very Twitter at that time. One Direction impressed me as well because they were direct marketing. They surprised Simon. Uh, Simon was blown away when they came to America and shut down Times Square. Nobody knew that was going to happen except for the boys in the band. They had been direct messaging their fans in America. Ari was the same thing. Ari had like 3,000 tweet drafts on her phone and we would be in the studio and she would say i think this is the right one this is my mood today i think this is the right one she would revise these drafts or tweak them a little bit and then send them out and she knew how her fan base would react and she knew what her follow-up tweet would be and all that stuff so i would say like really she has a genuine connection with her with her fan base that has just grown over time it's been super powerful they all came together for her in the wake of an absolutely brutal insane terror attack i mean how many artists have i get goosebumps thinking about that day i mean just like unbelievable hardship and her community is has grown stronger as a result of it. So I think there's something something really special about the way she connects with her fans. Obviously, to your point, so talented, such an amazing singer and a great writer, but there's just something about that direct connection that's always worked and that surprised us all, surprised Universal, surprised everybody in the mix was her ability to bring those fans with her and grow that base. 
Are you saying Ariana's main platform at that time to communicate with her fans was Twitter? Most definitely, yeah. But today, Twitter is the most impersonal platform. Yeah, I mean, the platform has moved to TikTok and it'll probably move somewhere else in a year or two. But that model is amazing. It's here to stay. You know, maybe we can also we can give Bieber a lot of credit for the model, too, which is you break on social media. Maybe it's covers, you know, uh, and you get that base and then it's your platform and your decision as to what you show that base. And I'm always advising especially TikTok uh, artists who are, who are amassing these just huge followings, like literally overnight. I'm always talking to them about like, okay, your audience is here. You're at Madison Square Garden every single minute of every single day. Like, what are you going to do with it? You know, what, what, how are you going to show them that you're real? Because that's why they're there. They want to see if you're real or not. And so can you do that? And she was always able to do that. I'm kind of thinking that if Ariana came out today, would she have the same success? Mm. And I'll tell you, see, she launched off of Twitter, which is very impersonal. It's just restricted the sound bites. But Ariana is not really an influencer like today's influencer. She is like this diva pop star. Like she sits on like this stage where I have a great voice. You know, I'm strikingly beautiful girl. Try to find a blemish on me. You can't kind of very elusive. Mm. So she is the ultimate pop superstar. But today, that's not how artists are launching like that. Mm. They are like relatable. See, the pop superstar or celebrity is everything you can't be. That's the lure. The influencer is, I'm just like you. Mm. I shovel the driveway. I take out the trash. But I have 10 million followers, and they listen to what I have to say. It's really interesting what you're, what you're, what you're talking about, too. And I, my connection, I was thinking about this sort of this morning because um, I was listening to Taylor Swift, and I'm, like, fascinated because – where Taylor Swift is also an untouchable, huge rock star, pop star. She is very successful on TikTok. Things are working. You know, all of her catalog is, is humongous on TikTok. And I was thinking about like, what is the difference there? And Taylor really is. She really is your next door neighbor in that way and larger than life in the way that you're describing, which is, it, it is very modern. It is, we know her. We could be her, but she also writes like our favorite songs. And so we feel like we're friends with Taylor. We don't feel like she's as on a pedestal or untouchable or diva ask. Very interesting. I also think about Doja Cat a lot right? recently. I I feel like Doja has gotten so many things right uh, that some of the other people who have launched off TikTok have not been able to embrace and it really is to your point there's a there's a relatability there's a different sense in the music musicality she's embracing a lot of different genres and a lot of different things that like really work on the platform yet she has her own sound um so i i see i see your point for sure on that nuance of where direct messaging and direct marketing was effective for One Direction and Ariana, but they were still, they used that to to build their pedestal. Now it's that same model, but it's used to build the fandom in a in a slightly different way, in, a, in an even more direct way. So I don't know. Do you think that Ariana could be that last untouchable superstar? 
Such a good question. Yeah, I mean, it's what she wants to be. It's what she always wanted to be. She wanted to be Mariah Carey. And I do have a theory that despite some of our best efforts, we usually get what we want. Um, we just have to know what we want. Uh, and so, you know, that is, that, that's exactly where she wanted to be. She wanted to be Mariah-esque and, and that's where she sits. You know, that's, that's that exactly where she wanted to land. So, you know, it's a really tough question. The, I think it's a, it's a, if I unpack your question, would she be able to break in today's market? The it, question gets more complicated because it's like, would she have chosen this style of music in today's climate? And would she have embraced the different musical styles or would she choose a different, slightly different path? And that's where my head goes, is that she would have looked at today's landscape and gone a little bit different stylistically. Yeah, that, that's an amazing way to look at it. It's like, it's like destiny. I mean... Like Mick Jagger, if you looked at today's maybe environment, he may be like, this isn't for me. Yeah. And we may have never gotten Rolling Stones. He may have been a nuclear physicist. Absolutely. You know, Brian May is. (laughs) He works down the street. (laughs) But um, the uh, thing about the Stones is that they did have moments like that, which is what makes them so amazing, you know, is that they did have moments where they sat down and went, and I think it was Mick, to my understanding, would sit down and go, we're not relevant this year. Like, we need to do a disco album. And, and, And we're so awesome that everybody will be cool with us if we do it, you know, and that we can... We can put on any style of jacket and we'll still be the Rolling Stones and I'll still move like I do and you'll still love it. The influencers today apparently seemed like they replaced the celebrity. They have for my kids, for sure. My eight-year-old, those are her rock stars. Uh, Mr. Beast and um, what's his name? Is it THC, I think? THC, there's a guy who's, he's like basically an internet philanthropist. He's a young guy, but he like gives away cars and stuff like that. That's like his big hook. She's got a whole community of people that she pays attention to that I had no idea even existed. It's amazing to see how the tables flip because at one point, everyone was trying to mimic the celebrity. But now when I actually go on TikTok, I see like the Hollywood celebrity trying to emulate the influencers. Yeah. It's funny. That's really interesting. (laughs) Totally see it too. And, and, and doing silly things, you know, like things that, that they think might go viral that probably won't. I've seen too many of those videos. Yeah. The, uh, the uh, contrived viral video is it's, pretty transparent these days it's funny we're, we're on the same page i saw one a couple of days ago i'm like sitting to myself you, you don't want to do that no and the thing is and i had this conversation with an executive yesterday it's like modern music business a lot of people i talk to scratching their heads how do we break an artist in this climate how do we use something that's not tiktok how do we do this how do we do that and i go have some freaking hits, dude. You know, it's like the same. There's no difference. It's like, come up with a freaking hit song. That's it. That's what it's always been. That's what it is now. That's what it always will be. It's like, if I, and and the same executive, like, what are your kids into? You have a, a test market in your house. I have a 12, 11, eight-year-old girls. It's like the best in-house marketing team or like, you know, a bullshit detecting team that you could ever ask for. And it's like, like, what, what are they into? And I'm like, honestly, they love show tunes and they will given the chance. If, if there's an artist that they love, that they absolutely love or a record or an album that they love in the same way that I used to go to a record store and buy the guns and roses album, and obsess and read the lyric sheet and immerse 
they do the same thing, but only if it's good enough. Like they did that with Olivia Rodrigo's album. They 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 loved it. They're done with it, but they loved it. And they that's all we listened to for two months, just like I listened to Guns N' Roses for two months straight. There's no difference. It's it's on the artists. It, it really is. Like we just have to make better stuff. If you make it good, everybody's gonna love it. And that does not matter which platform it launches off of. Labels do have a hard time, I think, breaking artists because there's only one platform to break on right now, TikTok. I've heard that before too. And you know what I always say? It's like, yo, that's such a big platform compared to when I was a kid, there was no platform at all. People look at the past in this weird way you know what i mean <laughs> like like especially like i have this debate all the time in the recording sphere about tape and everybody's oh the good no, we used to record on tape and it was out of incredible and the symbols and all this crap and i'm like tape sucked ass i hated biasing tape machines it made me crazy and like having to punch with a tape machine punch in like vocals stuff like that was the worst sucked and the records weren't better the musicianship might have been because you had to work harder to get a better take so there's something there but we look back with these weird glasses and it's like it's it's, it's the same you know you just you you gotta you gotta realize that tiktok as limiting as it is still a huge democratic you know workable medium that if you know what you're doing can use it to to gain as much exposure more exposure i think than you could have in the old world so you're working with an artist today so you you produce them and they ask you matt what should we do next you're going to tell them start a tiktok account yep yeah, I am. And then I will go one further. And I just had this conversation with an artist called Joey Valance. Great, great kids that kind of like East Coast hip hop, Beastie Boys, Tribe Called Quest. Like they're bringing that back and they're young and it's awesome. They were just on Ellen. They have 17 million followers. And they, they had a meeting with them and it was so refreshing because they were like, okay, we've done what a lot of other people have done. We use the, we use the right platform. We use TikTok. We've got 17 million, I don't know, 17 million followers or 17 million streams or whatever it was, but it was a lot of platform. And they said, what do we do? You know, like what's, what's next. And, and I said, well, you know, a lot of people in your position, right. The, they have a different problem, which is how do we get more followers? You don't have that problem. It's like, you're asking me, how do we, how do we show these followers who showed up for us, who, who, who are excited about us? How do we show them that we're real, that, that we make our own music, that we write our own music, that we're, we're good at performing our own music? Like, how do we show them that it's like, you know, not like a fraud? And I say, well, usually the answer is that you play live. And they're like, yeah, that's what we're doing. You know, we're playing some shows. And I'm like, but in your case, it's weird because when you play New York, you're playing to like 0.005% of those 17 million kids. Like you're not teaching them anything. You know, you, you haven't educated them at all. And so your game specific to this artist is how can you stream it all? Go play New York. That's great. Make sure South Korea can attend the show because if they can, then you are every single event giving those 17 million followers an opportunity to get to know your artistry and get to know what you just asked me is that how do you demonstrate that you're real in a quick way and capitalize on your fan base? Make sure they're there the whole time, because when you do these spot little shows and stuff like that, you have no visibility to the people who are catapulting you. And so you're not really telling your story. And that was that was a really fruitful conversation and we're going to continue that conversation because that's a theory. I don't know if I'm right, but I think there is that try my whole thing. And I know, you know, this now because we've talked about, right. But my whole thing is to find analogs is to go back and say, well, 
when posed with this question in 1990, Oasis said, well, we need to do this, 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 and this. So what is the 2022 version of demonstrating authenticity, of, of showing that you're real, of showing that you don't give a shit or whatever that you're trying to convey. And it's, it's wild because my, my mind goes to, you got big on the internet. So you need to use that tool in unique ways in order to demonstrate that capability. Otherwise it's going to take you just as long as it did in the past to, to, to really light up those Japanese followers or whoever you're trying to impress. So what is a 2022 version of this, this, and this is what we need? Yeah. So I really think it's always been important for artists to show different versions of their songs. That is what does it. That's what did it for me as a kid. That's why I love the Grateful Dead. You know, that's why I loved going to see live concerts when I was a kid. Because it'd be like, Yo, Counting Crow was like, dude, just change all the melodies to all the songs. I I liked this one better. I liked this one less, but I, I'm in because I'm like, he's talented. That's so weird. What a risk he took. Crazy that he would change his own melodies on the spot in front of, you know, 80,000 people. Like, I just always thought that was the thing, at least for me, that hooked me. I just go, man, that's so cool. Like, they took a risk. They did a different version. So I think it's about the piano version, the remix, and, and showing that an artist is sort of at the helm of all these different things. That's going to show me that they wrote their own song or, or had a hand in it. That's going to show me that they know their craft, they're talented. And that's going to show me that I might be surprised when I show up. I might get something amazing, something that none of my friends got, you know, just by showing up to that Malaysia show on a live stream or whatever it is. Playing live, I think, is always was important, but especially in the days of where you can fake it, it's more important than ever. Yeah. Right? 100%. And that's been a really weird evolution. Really weird. Extremely weird evolution. The whole... Seeing an artist live has been crazy. I agree. But I think it's also harder for an artist to work on that craft just because of the lack of venues today as well. Mm. Right? 100%. And it's harder than ever because pandemic closed a lot of venues. You know, it's... It really is. It's a difficult problem. Again, I I go to the internet and I just go, your nightclub is, is your site. You know, you have the ability to create your own MTV. You know, it, I've seen bands do it. So many of them, too many bands who have succeeded at capitalizing on the internet to pretend that that's not the tool, right? So it's free. It's by your own design, you have complete creative control. I mean, if we take the word internet out of it and we look back at the way we used to craft record deals, like my band got signed in the early 90s or in the late 90s, rather. And it was like that time where everybody was really scrutinizing the contracts. And it was like right before the 360 deals and the contract, the contract, the contract. And we always would vie for, we need 100% creative control and we need to be at the helm of this. And all this stuff. If you look at 2022, artists, they have it all. They have 100% creative control. They do whatever they want. So the question is, is are they creative enough? You know, are they Jimi Hendrix? You know, can they, can they command that audience and do enough crazy, you know, enough wild stuff to, to really command that fan base the way artists always have? That is a big question. And I think today it's a different type of artist. I think every generation we look at, there's artists and they, you know, artists are creative beings. And when they create something, you know, it's really manifesting, manifesting themselves. But today we're definitely living in a interesting environment 
now with TikTok, it's asking an artist or a potential artist to manifest one more thing that they didn't have to in the past. Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. Oh, oh, a thousand percent. I had this conversation yesterday too. It's like an artist has to have like, they have to be their own stylist. They have to be their own videographer, their own photographer, their own. They have to have like a hand in hip hop, a hand in punk, a hand in R&B, like this whole thing. And it's, it, and, and a friend of mine was saying, oh, it's incredibly daunting. Like, how do people do it? And it's like, I don't know. I can't do it. But Doja Cat can. She kills it. She, every single checkbox that we just listed, she can do all by herself, right? And so as long as there are artists, like, or The weekend, you know, like as long as there are artists who can pull off that insane ask, they're the ones who are going to be in command. And they are. They're killing it, you know? Weekend bigger than ever. I mean, and he does whatever he wants. Those songs are weird. They're so weird. Gasoline's so weird. I love it. It sounds like Flesh for Lulu or something. <laughs> it's like so out there. And I'm just like, he can do it. He can do whatever he wants. Now I know you you played just a you know a a a, a very narrow role working with Ariana Grande. But in those moments when you worked with her, who do you feel like has her ear? Who mm. is in control? Yeah, I think uh, that has probably changed over time. So I, I don't know, uh, you know, to your point, I worked with her in a specific point in time. During that point in time, which is the formative stages, she she was open to a lot of outside suggestions, but I would say that at the end of the day, the final decisions were made by her and her mom, um, who was really managing her at the time. I, I would venture a guess to say that that's evolved over, over time. But would you agree in the band world, the decisions either mainly fall on the group certain members of the artist, whether it's maybe one, the singer, like him, or two. And in rare cases, some bands have an equal voice in the most rarest of the rarest cases. And in the pop world, like an Ariana, a Demi Lovato, a Jewel, most of those decisions would come from the parents. Hmm. Would you agree to that? So it's interesting. Um, to a certain extent, yes. I wouldn't say that that I saw a lot of parents as complete decision makers, as opposed to maybe like the artists themselves being decision makers and the parents supporting and validating that, especially to people that they fear are music business executives who may try and like take advantage of, of their kid. So I've seen, I've seen that, right. That there's a rebel spirit within bands and there's a decision-making process that's completely insular. Right. And, and that even the managers aren't privy to, right. And then with solo artists, especially in pop, there's a different dynamic, but you know, it's so fascinating because I've, I've spun myself around over the years of like, Oh, the label person is the person to know, or, Oh, the manager makes the decisions or whatever. And the one common thread I'd say between band world and pop artist world is that 90% of the decisions are made by the artists, you know, even down to like, like in the pop world, everybody's always pitching songs. So an artist looks at 500 songs for their 10 song record. And we always go, oh, you know, the A&R person this and the executive this and the president of the label this. And most of the decisions I've seen were made by the artist. Most of the songs that either make it or don't make it onto records or make it as singles or don't make it as singles. It was the artist being like, that's it. That's the one with advice. But like really the final decision comes down to them. All right, Matt, barrier to entry. Any business has barriers. You just can't start a social media company. <laughs> Mark will see of that. 
And you're just not going to set up shop and start a car company. Toyota, we'll, we'll, we'll see that. But, and go try creating your own biotech company and say, I found a new drug that cures cancer. <laughs> Good luck getting past Pfizer. There's barriers. That's why there's never new. Because right. they make it very hard for you to succeed. There's a huge, there is a huge pit of dead bodies, of dreamers thinking that they were going to build the next car. Mm. Music, there's no barriers. What barriers? should be in place? Mm. It's a fascinating question because, you know, I think I actually think there are barriers and I think there are similarities between the biotech and automobile industry and the music industry. It's just, they're more opaque and it's harder to see, right? Because you can get a little far in music right you can get that visibility now which i couldn't as a kid but you can get that now without ever succeeding right without ever even seeing where the barrier is right you can have twenty thousand fans thirty thousand fans without even knowing where the barrier is mm -hmm. right the um the thing that i have seen um work and this, this is music this is every industry right but and I, th I think this is very hard for dreamers to get their heads around sometimes and why we have a lot of dreamers in the music business who are very unhappy too, right? Is that it's not just about the dream and it's not just about vision. It's about vision plus hard work. And it's such a cliche and we all talk about it, but it's like that whole thing about genius being 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration or whatever the ratio is like, it's real. And I've seen it. I've been inspired by artists, right? Where it's like, I might not have even had enough drive to, to push myself and they had more drive than me. And I just went, man, what's the difference between, you know, this singer and me? And why are they, why am I riding their success instead of us being on a collaborative success? And I, I have always believe it or not, come back to the conclusion that they were working harder and that they were staying up later and that they were settling less and that they were, that they were willing to like really push themselves to, to realize that original vision that they had and that there was no laziness and that there was no settling for something that kind of looks like the dream, but that, that they were help like, obsessed with like this specific kind of success that they were looking for and not going to stop until they got it. I've taken a lot of pages out of that book. My, my whole thing is about like just surviving, right? Because I never expected to be part of the mainstream music business. I'm a punk rock kid. I was sleeping on a mattress on a floor paying $300 of rent. And I was so super happy i was just like this is what being a musician is and i was totally fine with it and i just figured i'd get a real job someday until panic and then it just went nuts and i was like oh my god i never thought like i would be allowed in you know to your point about barriers i just never thought i would get there and then once i got there i was like okay here's the doorway right you'll never get me out right and i'll i'll make it my mission that you let me into the music business, I'm staying, right? I don't care what I have to do, I'm staying, you know? And so my whole- So what barrier? You mentioned there is a barrier, an invisible barrier. What barrier is that? So I just think it, it, in terms of being a producer, specifically to producer and songwriter, the barriers are, can you find the right balance between doing something that is progressive and innovative but also relatable enough to fly. Like, can you find that sauce? Because it exists. I've worked with Max Martin a bunch. He can do it almost every time, 
right? So it obviously these formulas exist. You, right? What did you What did you learn from Max Martin? So much stuff. Uh, it was like going to graduate school. Guys, unbelievable. It's super humble. So chill too. But yeah, I, I got to work with his crew for a couple of years on various projects and he was there and, you know, it's five studios set up. So we'll be in one room and he'll pop in every once in a while and just drop knowledge. But, you know, a lot of the things with him were formulaic. They were very like the structure of a melody should be like this the method acting of the singer should be like that. There were all these like, not rules, but there were these constructs that really enabled him to break through a lot of barriers. And when I pulled some of those lessons, I was like, okay, the barriers for me are me, right? They're my punk rock past. They're me saying, hey, I'm not willing to write a pop song i'm not willing that's cheesy or something like that you know what i mean for me the barriers were all in my head right there's other i think difficult circumstances where maybe an artist links up with the wrong team or something like that i've never seen a dysfunctional team make it i've just never seen it the only successes i've been a part of every single the manager the artist me the booking agent everybody was firing at a hundred percent. I've never had success unless all of those components were working in perfect harmony, at least for a certain amount of time while we, while we succeeded. Every other thing I look at, I go, manager wasn't right. Booking agent, artist, producer, you know, and I can always point to like something that, that was really holding them back. It's, it's only in those rare instances, right? Where, it's all working together. It's almost like a, um, a, a, a cosmic event, something that you had this momentum, you had this perfect tribe and a leader, and it just worked for a while. Yeah, and a zeitgeist timing. But you can look at that throughout time. Look at Jimi Hendrix, right? We all look at him as this like otherworldly alien-esque being, and he was. But that's not the whole reason he, he was successful. There were a lot of people in the background who were helping propel that success. Champions like the Rolling Stones, you know, that helps. So, you know, we look at these magical artists throughout history as being like, whatever. But they, those legends, they were not born legends. They did not come into the business legends. They had people that wanted them to be legends, that needed them to be legends for their own careers. And it, it all worked together. It's true. Uh, totally. And I also think what you talked about, there's working hard and having the right tribe and the right team where there isn't like that one stain on that team, which by the way, in most cases... You look at any organization, anything that's going on, you can always find the one stain. Yeah. Okay. But also too, let's say you get the perfect team. You have this momentum and you're just rolling. And then I think that you, you, you do what you do. Like some people talk about there's a tipping point, a tipping point. I've heard this term where people describe whether you're an author, whether you are a musician or an artist or whatever it is in life, whatever you're doing, they mention something called a tipping point that tips you over to that next level. And what is that tipping point? I thought about that. I'm not sure if it's a tipping point. I think there's something that, as you mentioned, there's timing and a converging point. So Matt, you do what you do every day. You produce, you songwrite. And I don't know your goals. I don't know like what you want to, everyone has their threshold of what they want to do. But let's say you want to be like, the next Max Martin. Maybe you don't. I'm just saying. So I'm sure a lot of songwriters would want to aspire to be the next Max Martin. Of course. Because he's written the most songs. 
besides the Beatles. Or actually, he's written more number one songs than the Beatles. Sorry. So you write songs every day. And you're like, I'm not the next Max Martin. But you're, you're building up your catalog. You're building up some artists. But then there's a converging point that happens. It's you hit that right artist at that right time, at that right moment. No one has that control. You don't. The people around you don't. We can't control history. I mean, religions were born off of converging points in history. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. 100%. 100%. And so... How, how do people like me become, you know, trusted, bankable? How does somebody like Max become trusted, bankable? Uh, very difficult, right? That's, that's what I saw. You know, that was the goal was like, how can I stay here? You know, this is amazing. Like, I understand panic is like this new thing and I could easily float out with, with it, you know, but, but how do I stay? And so I think it's, I think it's really important to have that strength of purpose of going like, well, what I'm here, what do I want? Right. And so for me, you know, what I wanted was to, was to stick around in order to do that. You got to keep putting out hits or, or putting out things. There's two arcs for me, you know, besides the artist development, which we've already talked about, which is identity crafting and making sure that that artist has a strong enough identity to, to fly. I do that. But, you know, from a musical perspective, you know, there's two things that I've had really, really great fortune with. I've had hits, but what I was really setting out to do was make timeless music, right? Legendary stuff, stuff where I could be a part of it. It would be a legacy. My kids would cherish it later, whatever. I did not know that I was succeeding in that mission until last year. And last year, all of a sudden, like the main and all time low and 303 and, and, and panic actually had their best year in forever. And all my songs ended up on TikTok again. And I said to myself, and now all my, all my kids liked my music all of a sudden. And I was just like, Oh my God, this is crazy. Cause they never liked anything I did before that. And um, I answered that, that challenge to myself. And I said, well, I just hit my goal. You know, I've made some stuff that was timeless. That's what I wanted. And I never thought I was going to achieve it. So it was an amazing feeling, but that was a very specific, very specific ask of myself. And it was a very long play and I had no idea if it was ever going to work out. And so it's been nice to enjoy that personal success, that personal goal achieved. And I think it's just, I think everybody gets what they want. It's just a lot of people don't know what they were seeking and what they actually wanted when they're really staring in the mirror. You know what I mean? And really asking like, what, what am I really seeking? Because a lot of people, whether they like it or not, are constantly sabotaging themselves because maybe they want to fail or maybe they, they wanted a different kind of success than they were enjoying or something like that. But I believe everybody gets what they wanted. I wanted to be part of punk rock, timeless classics. That's what I wanted. And that's, that's what I've gotten. And it's been such, such a joy to start seeing that. What are you working on right now? So it's a vast array of stuff. I just got back from LA where I wrote with the Treyu, um, 44 Phantom, who's a new artist on Columbia, Killboy, who's a new artist on Atlantic, uh, Dayseeker from Universal. Um, so those are like the most current current. Um, there's a, a great band uh, called Against the Current, current uh that uh, I work with on Electra, they're coming in in a couple of weeks. Um, so just a whole variety of different stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, really on that same mission of like, could be with a pop artist one day, a band the next day, and it's all music and we're looking for timeless classics. That's that's the, the common thread between all of that. Great. Well, you know, I really have a, a, a better insight of um your um background and who you are like i said um i i knew of you but but i we never really connected i guess just kind of like you know just different 
you could be in the business in a long time, but never really talk to anybody. I'm so glad you reached out to me though. It's so great to chat with you and, you know, just a million and one connection points. So I'm really appreciative. Thank you. Yeah, no, it was, it was a great conversation. And, um, you know, I, I know like the, everyone is starting a podcast today, but I can tell you I'm not jumping on the bandwagon because I've actually wanted to do this for a long time. Nice. And, um, be, yeah, I want to do this for a long time. And, um, it's just that now I have the time That's and great. Uh, right with, with, with COVID in the pandemic, it, 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 it reshuffled everyone's schedules. So a hundred percent. And, uh, you know, I, I had a lot of fun with it cause I'm an online recording. I've been obsessed with online collaboration since 2014. So I was back to work in a day and, um, built a whole company around the tech that I use for it and all that stuff. So isn't that, that amazing? I, is that amazing how just the remote recording today of how you can work with anybody in the world just, and they don't even need like an expensive mic. I know. <laughs> and I've cheated so many systems by being like, yeah, like I just recorded Alessia Carr on a USB mic <laughs> in Canada. I was in Mexico and we were doing a Metallica cover. I mean, just, you know, bananas. And um, the, uh, the trick there. As a producer in 2022, you need to be ready for anything. If somebody calls you for an online session, you can't complain about Zoom and glitchiness. You have to have a solution for that. I have a solution for that. You know what I mean? If somebody goes, well, yeah, but I need you to fly to Mexico tomorrow because the band's in Mexico and they're not getting on Zoom. You got to get on a plane. Like you, you can't be precious as a producer right now. You just can't. Now, now when you are actually recording someone remotely can you do it live virtually when and what pro and 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 what do you use it's all proprietary we built it all ourselves god oh so this is a home grown rig yeah so i could be on a zoom to talk to somebody right mm -hmm. but then they would go to a link on my site and they could see my logic screen and hear my audio in 32 bit if i want to record somebody I will actually take over the controls of their computer and I'll put like a logic pro or some DAW on their computer, have them set up a microphone in their apartment or their studio. Right. But I will run all the controls and I'll press record and I'll edit stuff and I'll do it all. And they can see it on their computer, but I'm controlling the decks. So it feels like I'm in a control room in there in a booth and the wildest stuff in the online paradigm is once you have that firmly established, because nobody does it, everybody does the like, oh, the audio is dropping out. Oh, I can't hear. You know, like that's what 99% of the online paradigm is right now. Oh, just send me files. Okay. Right. I am like, no, let's make you feel like you're in a booth and I'm in a control. And it takes an extra 15 minutes to set up maybe, or five minutes to set up or whatever it takes, but then we'll have that feeling, right? Once you establish that, the most amazing thing happens because the artist forgets they're online and then they just start going, Hey, can you, can we recomp this? And can we change this? And can we change that? And they, they get back to work. And I'm just like, yeah, this is now, awesome. now when you're guiding them, is it, is it through audio only or also through video? Video too. Video too. Now there are yeah. software apps out there for that too, as well. Right. Kind of <laughs> <laughs> nothing <laughs> worth, nothing worth, nothing very good. Right. It's all broken. And right. then it's like, okay, then you're just giving an artist a headache. If you're contributing to their general, like artists right now have it really bad with COVID. Like there's so many obstacles. Now you could get sick, your tour could get canceled, your record could flop. Like it's so terrifying to be an artist, whether they admit it or not, their community is under threat. Right. And so it's like, I don't want to add to their misery. I don't want to add to their confusion. What I want to do is give an artist magic, right? That's the producer's job, right? I want that artist to walk out of a physical studio or an online studio being like, that's my single. I killed it. I'm going to be huge, right? And so if I'm not delivering that, then there's no point in me being there and online too. So if I'm, de if I'm delivering glitchiness, they're going to be real bummed. So it's got to be pretty spotless. Great. All right, Matt. It was a great discussion. Right, thanks so much, Dean. Great chatting with you. And let me know.